Hey class, Mr. Moyadin here to introduce our new unit on transformations. Uh, we're going to look at them from both a Euclidean, uh, which is the blank plane, and a Cartesian, which is the coordinate plane, perspective. So let's dive in. Another word for transformations that you'll see, uh, they're not exactly the same, but uh, it's a subset of transformations, is a group called the rigid motions. Another name for rigid motions is the isometries. So you'll see a lot of these words somewhat interchangeably. Uh, rigid motions, transformations, and isometries. So what, what are they? What are we talking about here? We're talking about a functional operation. We'll talk some more about functions in class. Uh, applied to a figure that maintains size and shape. So when we're talking about rigidity, right, something that's rigid, that is uh, you know, firm, uh, it maintains size and shape, which, which is to say that the resulting shapes are congruent. So a rigid motion or a transformation, a movement of an, of an object is rigid if the beginning and the after objects, and we'll come up with some better words for that in class, if those are congruent. So there are three basic types that we want to talk about. Uh, they're, they're, everyday English terms are here, turn, flip, and slide, but there are some more sophisticated terminologies associated with each. So the first one we'll talk about is a rotation, better known as a turn. And it's important to realize that a rotation occurs around a point through an angle measure. So when you turn something, you don't just turn, uh, you know, a certain amount and just hope it ends up in the right place you have to have what's called a center of rotation, and you'll see that in the picture right here. A center of rotation and a degree measure to turn in. So if someone tells you, you know, in dance class or something, uh, you know, now do a 180, well, that's the degree measure, and presumably you're going to rotate around your, one of your feet, right? So that would be the fixed point. So rotation has a point of the rotation and an angle measure through which it rotates. Uh, the second one, which is normally called a flip in, in everyday English, is called a reflection. And those occur not around a point and not around an angle measure, but rather across a line. So reflections have to have a line of reflection. And here you can see in this uh, example here, this would be the line uh, of reflection. If I can draw on it at least. There we go. So you see it makes sort of a symmetrical picture, and moreover, you have these 90-degree angles. We'll talk more about that. But rotation, reflection, and a slide. So if something's sliding around the plane, we call that a translation. In a translation, you'll notice if we have the original image and then the new, uh, the new form, we have what are called vectors. And we'll talk more about vectors in class. The translation along a vector. Now, briefly, what is a vector? Just you know, as a preview for what we'll talk about in class, a vector is a directed line segment, so it's giving you both direction and magnitude. In what direction are we going? We're going in this direction. How far are we going in that direction? That's the magnitude. So a vector tells you where you're going and how far. So translation occurs along a vector, a reflection, a flip across a line, a rotation, a turn through a degree measure uh, around a point. So these are all examples of rigid motions. Now I want you to notice that both the beginning pre-image, which is sort of these, these grayed out images, these are the pre-images, and the resulting image, the second resulting figure, each of these figures are congruent to each other. You can just kind of look at that at the naked eye, but we'll, we'll come up with some more uh, specific reasons for that in class. So a rigid motion maintains congruency. So you'll notice these, all three of these examples are on the Cartesian plane because you have this grid in the background. But I want you to be aware that these transformations can also occur in the Euclidean plane. So here we don't have a grid. So here you see another ex example of a translation, a slide, and here's the vector uh, across, with, across which the translation is occurring. Rotation, once again, with a degree turn around a fixed point, and a reflection across a line. All right. Now there's this fourth one here, which we haven't talked about, called a dilation. 
do you notice how these two figures, the blue and the red in the dilation, are not congruent? The, the, the shape looks the same, but the size has different. They're not identical. So this is what we call a non-rigid motion. It doesn't maintain the fixed uh, size of the shape. So it's a non-rigid motion. And we'll talk more about dilations in the future, but keep in mind that it has a point or a center of dilation. So you kind of have this effect happening. So we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. We're going to mainly focus on these three for, the, for this unit. That's translation, a slide, rotation, a turn, a reflection, a flip. Now, there are two ways to think about all three of these operations. Uh, sort of in the forwards and the backwards uh, direction. You want to be able to do both. So these are two of the skills, uh, sort of reworded, but that you want to be able to do by the time we're done with our unit in a, in a couple of weeks. So what you want to do is to, if you're given a shape or a figure, you want to apply a transformation to it. So I might give you a shape either in Euclidean space or uh, on a grid and say, all right, uh, reflect this across the line y equals x. And you'll have to draw that shape. And of course, if it's a rigid motion, then the shape should be congruent, although in a new location. So that's the forward direction. Given one shape, make another according to a specific rule. The backwards direction, sort of the opposite, would be here are two figures, and the question is which isometry or which rigid transformation was performed to turn one shape into the other. It's sort of like if someone has already done the work of making two shapes, you've got to figure out how it was made. So given two figures, identify which rigid motion or isometry maps one onto the other, and then not just you know, describe, oh, this was a reflection that happened, but more specifically, write a function describing the motion. So this is a little bit harder, at least in my opinion. Here, all you've got to do is draw a new figure, and it's a little more precise than that, but, but for the most part, uh, it's not too difficult. But coming up with the reason for which one shape turned into another is a little more complicated. So let's do a quick example. So here you have uh, two figures. Now, there's a couple things I want to, uh, to identify here right off the bat that you might not be familiar with. So one question that often people would have looking at something like this is, well, which was the original and which is the, uh, the new one, right? Which is the pre-image, which is another name for the original, and what is the image, the new resulting figure? Well, you'll notice carefully that you have A prime, C prime, and B prime. So these little apostrophes next to the, uh, the letter here, we pronounce those as primes. So, and the, and the other ones would be just be, you know, normal A, B, and C, nothing complicated there. So the prime would be the new one. So when you see a little prime image like that, or an apostrophe like that, that's telling you this is the resulting figure. So the, in this picture, the blue was the original, the blue triangle, and it has been transformed by an isometry into a red uh, triangle. So we've got to figure out, first of all, what kind it was, and then how was it done. So I want you to think for a moment. To go from blue to red, the blue triangle to the red triangle, was this a slide, a translation, a reflection, a flip, or was it a turn, a rotation? And if you look at it closely, you should be able to figure out that this was a translation. The orientation of the figure has not changed in any way. It's still facing basically the same direction, uh, but it's in a new location, so it's translated along a certain uh, vector. So the vector here, and again we'll talk more about vectors uh, in class, but a vector here would be something like this. A direction, which is in, you know, roughly southeast, uh, and a certain magnitude, how far southeast are we going? A bunch of points or just a few? So let's be a little more precise here. C has mapped onto C prime. So let's look at the numbers here, and that's what the Cartesian plane allows us to do. We had negative 3, and now we had 1 as the x value. So I'm going to introduce something here that I'm going to call arrow notation. So this is called arrow, if I can write, arrow notation. It's a way of describing exactly what kind of slide was performed. So we start off with the original point x, y, and we figure out, well, what did x, y become in the new shape? So let's look for a second. We have negative 3, and it became 1. That was the x coordinate. And the y values was negative 2, and it now is negative 5. So let's focus on the x's for a minute. How did these numbers turn from one into the other? 
Well, there's a variety of ways you can turn negative 3 into 1. You might multiply by a, by a negative and then multiply and then you know, divide by 3. But you want to be aware that it has to work for all of them. So notice that a becomes a prime and b becomes b prime. So I'm making these little arrows here to kind of show you sort of a preview of how this is occurring. We're moving along the grid both right and down in each shape, and that's how the shape, the, the red shape, is, of course, to the right and below the blue shape. So let's be more precise. It was negative 6, and now it's negative 2, the B point. It was 2, and now it's 6. So hopefully you can notice that in all three of those cases, the A to A prime, the B to B prime, and the C to C prime, the X coordinate, which used to be just X, is that original number plus 4. So if you take negative 6 and add 4 to it, what do you get? You get 2. You take negative 3, you add 4 to it, you get 1. You take negative 2, and you add 4 to it, uh, and you get... Uh... Sorry, uh, I misspoke there. Uh, you get the idea. You add 4 to the x-coordinate, you move right 4. So another way of thinking about this is right 4. That's not the only movement, it also moved down. So how far down did it move? Well, the y-coordinate here used to be 4, but now it's 1. It used to be negative 2, and here it's negative 5. It used to be 1, and now here it's negative 2. So it's moved down, so we know we're going to take away from the y-coordinate. And we're moving down, well, 4 to 1, here 4, and here 1. That's a downward movement of 3, and that works if you notice for all of them. So y minus 3. So there's a way of giving two figure, given two figures, come up with what kind of isometry performed it. It was a translation, and describe a rule, a function, that turns one shape into the other. So there's a lot of vocabulary we've talked about here, so let me do a quick uh, rehab, recap of what we've talked about. Go back a few slides. We have transformations, and the three major rigid transformations, or isometries or rotations, reflections, and translations, and those occur along certain parameters, as we've talked about. There's also a non-rigid motion, which we won't talk too much about uh, at the moment, but that's called a dilation. And it's non-rigid because it doesn't maintain size, right? It's not fixed. These are the two skills you want to be able to do. And we just did an example of this one right here. Here are two figures. Identify what kind of transformation it was and come up with a numerical function or rule that turns one shape into the other. All right, I will see you in class.